very kind introduction and thank you also uh, to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present here today it's really really an honor and uh, yeah i hope that um, this will be uh, an insight into what my lab is doing and um, i'm looking forward to uh, some discussion of this in the q a but also if you feel uh, that you would like to um, ask a question during the uh, seminar um, please uh, feel free to interrupt um, if you can do so perhaps via the chat and maybe uh, Roy Han can monitor and check if there's something that I need to uh, explain as I'm going along. So um, I'm Peter and uh, my lab is based at the London Institute of Medical Sciences uh, at Imperial College London and we are working on using evolution in order to understand a little bit more about epigenetic mechanisms. And I'm gonna explain um, how we do that. So there are two aspects of the connection between epigenetic gene regulation and evolution that we are working on. And the first is a fundamental question of whether epigenetic changes alone in the absence of DNA sequence changes can ever drive evolutionary processes. And the second aspect of the connection between evolution and epigenetics that we're interested in is to look at the evolution of epigenetic pathways themselves. And the reason we're particularly interested in this is because epigenetic pathways show an enormous diversity across different species, but also fascinatingly in cancer where many different types of cancer involve serious perturbations to the epigenetic gene regulatory machinery. And what we're trying to do is to understand what drives these changes that happen to epigenetic gene regulation in cancer by using evolution across species um, to explore the reasons behind it. And I'm gonna start with a story in the lab that we published recently, which, um, illustrates how we can use the evolution of epigenetic pathways across species to get new insights into the fundamental mechanisms behind epigenetic regulation. And this work focused on the evolution of DNA methylation. So DNA methylation is a classic form of epigenetic gene regulation. And what's important here is that it's very, very ancient. So we find very similar processes of DNA methylation taking place in plants and mammals. And we can infer from that, that DNA methylation must have evolved very early in the earliest eukaryotic organisms, in fact. However, what's really interesting is that in many different organisms, DNA methylation has been lost subsequently. So for example, many familiar model organisms that we use in the lab have no DNA methylation, such as yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which doesn't have DNA methylation, also C. elegans, the fruit fry, Drosophila. These have lost DNA methylation, and we know that they've lost it relatively recently because we can find ancestors which do have DNA methylation, such as, for instance, other types of fungi which contain DNA methylation. There are some forms of parasitic nematodes which contain DNA methylation, and ancient arthropods like spiders have DNA methylation. So it occurred to me when I was starting my lab that it's these repeated losses of DNA methylation are very interesting. And they imply that perhaps there's something that makes DNA methylation be lost frequently. Is there some sort of burden associated with it? Some negative consequence, which explains why it's an advantage for some species to lose DNA methylation. So in order to investigate this, we took a very simple approach. What we did was to look bioinformatically for proteins that are in the human genome that are present in species that have DNA methylation and are lost in species that don't have DNA methylation. And so from this, we could actually look for potential co-evolving proteins, proteins that actually co-evolve with DNA methylation across millions of years of evolution. And what we found from this analysis was very surprising. Co-evolving proteins 
that are present when DNA methylation is present and absent when it is absent are strongly enriched for DNA repair pathways. And you can see this here from uh, this diagram, which shows the top five terms of enriched gene ontology when we look for co-evolving proteins. And we find that these are almost all associated with DNA repair. So what is going on here? What's the explanation for this? And um, a way into this came from one of the proteins that we found in this category of DNA repair proteins, which co-evolves with DNA methylation. And this is the protein ALKB2. So ALKB2 um, has a paralog in mammals, ALKB3, and this gene is present whenever DNA methylation is present, shown here illustrated by the nematodes. So nematodes here on the left-hand side have DNA methylation. You can see they've all got ALKB, but these nematodes have all lost DNA methylation and they've also lost the ALKB protein. It's not conserved. Now, the reason that this was interesting is because ALKB has a very clear and well-known substrate. So what it does is it repairs a very particular type of DNA damage, which is 3-methylcytosine. 3-methylcytosine is formed, classically anyway, by alkylation damage. And what this modification does is it sits on the base pairing side of the uh, cytosine residue, the 3 position. And this interferes with replication and is very toxic. So the ALKB2 enzyme can recognize this and repair it to leave the original cytosine. So it basically completely removes this form of damage from the DNA. So it occurred to me that perhaps there's a connection between this highly toxic form of DNA damage, 3-methylcytosine, which is very bad for cells, and the form of DNA methylation, which is introduced by DNA methyltransferases, 5-methylcytosine, which is involved in epigenetic gene regulation and therefore is something that cells actually use. So maybe there's a connection between these two, um, these two modifications to cytosine residues. And the simplest explanation for this might be that DNA methyltransferases themselves, as well as introducing 5-methylcytosine, perhaps they actually damage the DNA introducing 3-methylcytosine at the same time. So we decided to test this hypothesis. And what we did was to take mouse embryonic stem cells in which we have deleted all three DNA methyltransferases. And we developed a technique to measure three methylcytosine, this damage in the DNA. And what you can see very clearly from this trace, which shows mass spectrometry for three methylcytosine, is that when we have all the DNA methyltransferases present, we can detect 3-methylcytosine very clearly. But when there's no DNA methyltransferases, we lose it completely. So in other words, almost all of 3-methylcytosine, which we find in cells, is actually introduced by DNA methyltransferases. So in addition to their usual substrate, 5-methylcytosine, it appears that they're introducing this form of DNA damage into cells. And in fact, this is a direct catalytic activity. And we can show this by taking the DNA methyltransferase enzyme, purifying it, and using it in vitro with a plasmid. And what we can see here is that um, if we take the in vitro purified DNA methyltransferase, we can see that there's an induction of 3-methylcytosine. And that is not present when we purify instead a catalytically inactive form of the enzyme. So this shows that there's a catalytic activity of DNA methyltransferase, which introduces this toxic substrate, 3-methylcytosine, into the DNA. So the model that we came up to explain this is that there's a cost associated with DNA methyltransferase activity, and that is the formation of this highly toxic form of DNA damage, 3-methylcytosine. And so you need to have this enzyme, ALKB2, present whenever DNA methylation is present in order to clean up, if you like, after the DNA methyltransferase. 
So most of the time, DNA methyltransferase introduces this gene regulatory form of methylation, 5-methylcytosine. But occasionally, DNA methyltransferases make an error. They introduce 3-methylcytosine into the DNA, and this then requires the ALKB enzyme in order to uh, correct it. So that explains potentially why in species where DNA methylation is present, ALKB2 enzyme is also present. And in species where DNA methylation is absent, you don't have ALKB2 potentially because you no longer need it because this form of damage is no longer being introduced. So what we decided to do was to test this subsequently using a uh, in-lab evolutionary um, model. And what we did was we generated a bacteria, E. coli, that expresses very active form of DNA methyltransferase. And what we could do is we could um, use this in order to test whether the ALKB enzyme repairs the uh, damage caused by the DNA methyltransferase activity. And um, essentially what we can do is we can introduce this plasmid containing the DNA methyltransferase. We can introduce it into cells that are either wild type or have the ALKB enzyme deleted. And then we can monitor how long this plasmid lasts for. So we can actually see the stability of the plasmid in either wild type background or background compromised for the ALKB repair system. So the first thing that we notice from this is that there's a fitness cost associated with the addition of this methyltransferase into E. coli. Um, as you can see here, if we compare between the wild type and the wild type with the DNA methyltransferase here in red, we can see that there's a decrease in its growth. But really importantly, this is more strong when we have the ALKB mutant. So we can see here that this is a um, significantly greater decrease in growth when we have the ALKB mutant. And we can really exacerbate this by adding a form of DNA damage that's very similar in what it produces to the DNA methyltransferase. So in other words, it introduces this 3-methylcytosine into the DNA, and that's MMS. And you can see that having both MMS and the enzyme present leads to a big cost in growth, and that's really markedly the case in this ALKB mutant. So here, when you put the two together, it really knocks out the cells. So that is an indication that there's a cost associated with the DNA methyltransferase, which is um, the introduction of the three methylcytosine damage. And then what we can do is we can actually directly test our evolutionary hypothesis because we can evolve E. coli in the lab. Because obviously E. coli grows really fast, so we can do many, many generations in the lab. And what we can do is we can test whether if you have the um, plasmid present, but then you remove the selection for the plasmid, how long does it last in either the wild type situation or the situation which doesn't have the DNA repair? And what we can see is that um, the plasmid is lost very much more rapidly in the ALKB background than in the wild type. So we can monitor the presence of the plasmid by plating out on a resistance marker for the plasmid. So if the plasmid is present, then cells will grow on this plate. And we can see that after one day, the plasmid is still retained because we can see colonies on both plates. But after seven days, now the plasmid is only retained in the wild type and it's been lost completely in the ALKB mutant. And we can speed this up dramatically by adding this alkylation agent, MMS, which, as I said, introduces the same type of damage, this 3-methylcytosine. So now in the ALKB mutant, after only two days, we've completely lost the plasmid. So this has really accelerated the loss of the DNA methyltransferase activity. Um, and even in wild type, it speeds up the loss. So after five days, we've lost it. So this shows clearly that there is um, a cost associated with DNA methyltransferase activity, firstly, more, and moreover, what it shows is that if you lose the ALKB enzyme, 
this means that you are more likely to lose DNA methylation. So that supports our hypothesis that the reason that species with DNA methylation have alkylation repair is because of the damage introduced by DNA methylation. And at the same time, if you don't have the alkylation repair system, then that means that there's a pressure to lose the DNA methylation activity, which might explain potentially why species that don't have the ALKB enzyme don't have DNA methyltransferase activity. So in the second part of my talk, I'd like to address this other side of the circle that I was talking about connecting epigenetics and gene regulation uh, and evolution. And this is the question of whether epigenetic changes can ever drive evolutionary processes, potentially in the absence of changes to the DNA sequence itself. So in order to introduce this, um, I need to tell you about the particular type of epigenetic change that we are interested in here, that we're studying. What we're using is pi RNAs. So it doesn't really matter too much about what these are. What's more important is what they do. So what the pi RNAs do is they cause silencing. And this is particularly dramatic when we consider uh, transgenes. So you can introduce transgenes into the C. elegans genome. So you can modify C. elegans to contain, for example, the GFP. And if you put a target site for a pi RNA in the three prime UTR of that GFP, then the pi RNA pathway can recognize it and silence it completely, okay? Now, the crucial point here is that this silencing is epigenetic. And we know that it's epigenetic because what you could do is you can take this silent transgene and you can cross it to a mutant that does not have the pi RNA pathway at all, right? And the transgene will remain silent, right? So the reason this is, that shows that it's epigenetic is because what happens is that the pi RNAs have initiated the silencing, but they're not remain, they're not required for the silencing to remain. So the silencing can be retained independently of the initial signal. And that is the definition of epigenetics. And we can also show this in a particularly dramatic way, because what we can do is we can take this silence transgene, this GFP that was silenced by the pi RNA pathway, and we could cross it to a reporter that doesn't have a pi RNA target at all. And the silencing will spread onto the reporter. And then that reporter will also remain silent for many generations. So that again is epigenetic because the signal for this, it doesn't apply here. And yet it can be silenced and remain silent independently of the pi RNA pathway. So how does this work? The crucial point is that the formation of pi RNAs, the pi RNA recognition triggers the formation of another type of small RNA called 22G RNA. And once these have been formed, they can then lead to transcriptional silencing of the gene. And crucially, they can be retained independently of the pi RNAs. So once you form these 22G RNAs, they bind to a protein called HRDE1. And when bound to that protein, they can trigger their own formation. So they can form a positive feedback loop in a way that doesn't require this initial signal at all. So just to confuse things, in C. elegans, there is another type of 22G RNA, which is formed without pi RNAs. And this binds to a different protein called CSR1. And I mentioned this only because instead of silencing, this type of pathway seems to be involved in um, somehow in a, preventing the silencing of genes. So sort of anti-silencing, it's the opposite activity to this. And this can act for us as a comparison when we compare between the targets of these pi RNAs and uh, the targets of these type of CSR1 RNAs, which don't require a pi RNA pathway.
So the establishment and the maintenance of silencing at trans genes in C. elegans is pretty well understood. People know it quite well mechanistically. And once you silence these trans genes, as I said, they can remain silent for a really long time, hundreds and hundreds of generations, independently of the initial pyRNA signal. But what we were really interested in is can this silencing by small RNAs in C. elegans, which can last for hundreds and hundreds of generations, can it act to contribute to evolution? So can it drive evolutionary processes in the same way that a DNA sequence change could drive evolution? So we really wanted to study this and um, we realized that there are several key parameters here which are not known. So what we don't know is whether this type of silencing that we see so clearly at trans genes actually happens at normal genes as well. So genes in the C. elegans genome. So in order for it to contribute to evolution, it would have to contribute to the regulation of endogenous genes, and we don't know that. The second point that we don't know is if something arises like this, some silencing, which we call an epimutation, because it's an epigenetic change, um, which is not associated with DNA sequence change, if we get an epimutation at an endogenous gene, how stable is it? How long does it last for? And then third, once we have this, can it actually contribute to phenotypic changes? So can it lead to changes in the expression of different genes and therefore to potentially to be acted on by evolution? So we wanted as a first point here to actually just measure these parameters, the rate at which epimutations arise, how stable they are, and whether they can actually lead to any changes in gene expression. So in order to do this, we collaborated with a lab in the States. This is uh, led by Vishali Katyu. Um, and what Vishali, Vishali uh, is an expert in is a process called generation of mutation accumulation lines. So classically, mutation accumulation lines are used in order to look at the rate at which DNA sequence changes arise. Now, the reason for this is because if you are comparing between two different populations, like let's say, for example, you compared worms in Europe to worms in the US, and you looked at their DNA sequences, you would find lots of differences. But it would be very difficult for you to know what the rate at which those differences arose between those two different groups. And the reason for that is because natural selection would only allow changes that are neutral or beneficial to persist. So if a change happens, if a DNA sequence change happens, and that is deleterious, so it's either lethal or it makes the animals not fertile or uh, it makes them grow slowly, then natural selection over time will mean that those mutations don't persist in the population. So you're only left with things that are um, a fraction of the actual mutations that happen. So in order to get around this, what you can do is you can minimize as much as possible the effect of natural selection. And you do this by bottlenecking, by selecting a very, very small fraction of the population. And in worms, we can actually just select one worm every generation. So we start with an ancestor and then we evolve that ancestor in the lab but we do so under conditions of which natural selection is not active. So we randomly pick one worm and we do this several times and we then propagate these lines for many generations. So typically at the end of a long period of time, you would then look at what DNA sequence changes had occurred. But what we decided to do was to look not at DNA sequence changes, but at epigenetic changes by looking at these small RNAs that are involved in epigenetic gene silencing in C. elegans. So what we did was we made RNA after 25 generations and after 100 generations from each of these lines. And we then looked at these to see if we could find epimutations. So the first point is that we do find these epimutations. Here's an example. So we visualize these genome-wide by looking at how many small RNAs there are mapping to each particular gene. 
And at this particular gene, we can see that at the beginning, shown in red here, there's hardly any RNAs mapping. But then after um, 25 generations, we can see that there's a considerable amount that, that they've, they've randomly arisen in that particular line. And um, in this particular line, uh, which is after 100 generations, we also see um, that epigenetic uh, regulation by these small RNAs has uh, arisen. So what we can do is we can use a statistical procedure to identify statistically significant loci where we get more of these um, small RNAs than we expect by chance. And then we can classify all of our lines into whether they have high small RNAs or low small RNAs. We can do this across the different lines and compare to the ancestor. So the next key question after we've done this is to say, if something arises after 25 generations, how stable is it? Can we still detect the same thing after 100 generations in the same line? And the answer to this seems to be no. So we can see this from this bar plot here. This is the number of epi mutations that we find. And we can see that um, in this particular line, after 25 generations, we've got about uh, 50 of these, and we have about uh, 50 that are present in um, the uh, 100 generation line, but only a very small fraction of these are present in both these uh, situations. So in the same line, after 25 generations and after 100 generations, very, very few are shared. So this suggests that these epi mutations arise perhaps but they're not stable. So the vast majority of them do not stick around. And in fact, so few of them do stick around that we can't tell whether the ones that we see that are the same have just arisen independently. So they could have gone away and come back again. And we can't statistically tell whether that is the case. Um, and this is be because we find no more of these than we would expect by chance if they are just randomly coming on and off in the different um, situations. So this was a bit disappointing because we were hoping that perhaps at endogenous genes similar to transgenes, we would get situations where an epi mutation occurred and then persists for a really long period of time. And in fact, we don't find that at all. So we then started to be a bit worried. We were doubting whether epi mutations can actually happen at all. So do they just go on for one generation and then go away? Can they ever persist for even longer than one generation? So to do this, what we had to do was to grow worms. And instead of looking at 25 and 100 generations, we had to look at each individual generation. And we did this for a period of 14 generations to fine map these epi mutations. So, okay, we don't see them lasting between 25 and 100 generations, but do we see them perhaps lasting over a much shorter period of time? And so we did this, which was quite labor intensive because we had to pick the worms and make RNA and sequence the RNA every generation for 14 generations. So very hard work by a really, really good PhD student in the lab called Tony Beltran. And what he was able to do from this is actually to really definitively show that epi mutations really do happen, but they're just really transient. So here's a really clear example. So at this particular gene, we find that in the beginning, there's very few small RNAs that map to it, right? And that's the case, remains so for four generations. And that generation five, suddenly bang, comes and we see these small RNAs in red here across the locus. And they persist for four generations and then they go away again. Right? So that shows that there is an epi mutation here and it is inherited, but it's inherited for only a very small period of time. So when we pool all this data together, we can actually map to say, what's the half-life of epi mutation, if you like? On average, how long do epi mutations last for? And what we could do from this is we can do a sort of survival analysis, um, which allows us to estimate the survival probability of an epi mutation. And we can see 
that most epi mutations which involve an increase in small RNAs have a very short half-life. So approximately 50% of them have gone after two generations. So on average, the half-life is only two generations. Now, interestingly, if we find a loss of small RNAs, we actually find that they are more stable. So here we can see that the half-life is more or less five generations, so 50% of them still persisting. But nevertheless, overall, these epimutations are decaying away quite rapidly. And so that explains why, if we look at 25 generations and 100 generations, if I go back to that slide, so few of the epimutations were shared between the two. And that's because 75 generations is a really long time if, on average, they only last for two to four generations, right? The vast majority of them will have completely gone after uh, 75 generations. So what is explaining this short half-life of the epimutations? Well, what we found is that these epimutations are strongly rich for genes that already, if you take the epimutations out of it completely, have fluctuating levels of small RNAs. So they tend to have unstable levels of small RNAs. So what we can do is we can map the noise in small RNA by plotting the coefficient of variation, which is a measure of noise, against the number of counts of the small RNAs, so how abundant they are. And we typically expect, this is very expected to see this plot where the more abundant something is, the less noise it shows. But what we can do is we can use this plot to identify things that are more noisy than we would expect by chance. So those are these hypervariable genes which have more noisy small RNAs than we would expect. And what we can show is that these overlap very nicely both with pi RNA targets and with our epimutations. Look at this overlap. So out of the 440 or so epimutations that we detect, 400 of them are also within this set of hypervariable genes. So it's a really strong enrichment here. So essentially, what we think is that these epimutations are a sign of a process whereby these loci have noisy levels of small RNAs, and that makes them more prone to epimutation. And importantly, what we also find is that in general, the targets of these pi RNAs that I mentioned right at the beginning that kick this process off, these are also more likely to have noisy levels of small RNAs. So again, this is the same plot that I showed here, but highlighting the pi RNAs compared to the rest of the genes, and we can see that they're much more noisy. And if, in contrast, we take this other type of small RNA, which, as I said, we can use as a control because it's not involved in silencing, these show actually less noise than we would expect by chance. So that shows that this process of generating noise seems to be associated with the process of generating epimutations. And that potentially explains why they are so short-lived, because they come on for a little bit, but because their levels are not stable, they then go away. So what I'd like to propose is that evolution is a little bit more complicated than simply point mutations. Because it's not just DNA sequence changes that are involved in evolution, but also epigenetic changes as well. But there's a key difference epigenetic changes are very low in their stability. So they arise very frequently, but they are um, very low in their stability. And this contrasts to a classic DNA sequence change, where once that DNA sequence change has arisen, it's very unlikely that it will go away. It has a very, very high stability. And so what we think is that these processes where there's epigenetic changes, they can contribute to evolution, but only over very short timescales. Whereas over long timescales, you need to have DNA sequence changes um, in order to drive these processes. And what we're really interested in working on now is whether other types of epigenetic changes other than small RNAs, for example, chromatin organization, 
and perhaps DNA methylation, although that's not present in worms, so we'd have to use another model organism in order to test that. Um, whether these fit at different points on this spectrum of molecular evolution, um, and, and therefore whether they can contribute to evolutionary processes, but only over short timescales. So that's uh, what we're really interested in, in looking at next. So I'd like to finish there. And I'd like to uh, thank you all for your uh, attention. And um, I'd like to also acknowledge the funding that made this work possible. So very uh, lucky to be supported by the fantastic Medical Research Council in the UK, which has um, been really supportive. And uh, this is at uh, the London Institute of Medical Sciences, where again, um, I've been really, really, really well supported, really lucky to be. Um, I've got uh, some funding from the EMBO, it's a young investigator program, and um, my group, the Transgenerational Epigenetic Inheritance and Evolution Group, uh, here, shown in this, in, in this photo, um, and in particular, Tony Beltran, a PhD student who's just left the lab, and he's uh, really, really great, and um, going to have a, a stellar career ahead of him, I think, so watch out for that name. Also, collaborators, Petra Heikeba, who helped with the DNA methylation work um, that uh, uh, I talked about at the beginning of the talk, and on the epimutation project, um, Vashali Katyu at uh, Texas A&M University, and we had some help with the maths from uh, Vahid Shahzari at the uh, uh, Imperial College London uh, Biomathematics Department. So uh, once again, thank you very much indeed for your attention and for the opportunity to speak at this great uh, trend series. And uh, I'd be really happy to take uh, any questions.